Hey everyone, this is Mr. Anderson, and today we're getting together to talk about lesson 8.2.3 from our CPM Common Core Algebra text. And um, our goal today is to discuss an alternative method for finding those roots or those x-intercepts, um, because it's not always going to be the case uh, where they're easy enough to find through using some algebra. So we're going to investigate some alternative methods here, and I've put together some notes for us, and these are a modification for the purposes of this uh, distance delivery uh, via technology today. So, um, yeah, uh, we de developed that method for finding x-intercepts of a parabola um, by evaluating uh, for y equals zero. So, uh, setting y equals zero and then using uh, a factorizing technique and a uh, zero product property. And today, we're going to use a graphical technique to help us um, as a bit of an aid, and we'll see a need for that here in just a moment, right? So uh, we start with the problem from the text, and this problem is 8-77, and it says use the zero product property to find the roots of this, um, this equation, y equals x squared minus 3x minus 7. Um, and it asks me outright what happened. Okay, so here we go. Uh, I would start by taking this thing and just simply setting it equal to zero and trying to factor, because so far... That is the only method that we have. And just to give you an idea here, I've taken this and I've set it up ahead of time using our CPM uh, E tiles. And I've got an X squared, I've got negative three X's, and I've got negative seven here. And remember, when we were learning how to factor, we were trying to build rectangles. Now look at, I don't care how I arrange these, right? Here's just one example of how I can arrange this. When we arrange these, we've got to build a, a rectangle with no gaps, with no overlaps, and we've got to use all the tiles. Now, for sure, I've got a rectangle with no gaps and no overlaps, but I don't have all the tiles used. Okay, and it doesn't matter if I drop this down here. It doesn't matter if I drag this over here and try to, try to arrange these on the side somewhere. I'm not going to get... I'm not going to get a rectangle out of this with no gaps and no overlaps. So we run into a situation here. Um, the, the answer to the what happened is I couldn't build the rectangle. And, and, and what does that mean? It tells me that my um, equation, my, my trinomial expression, is not a factorable one. Okay, so this means we got to come up with an alternative method for solving. Um, I'm sorry, for uh, finding the roots. And um, it, it, it potentially means that my roots are not going to be these nice positive or negative whole number values uh, or these nice integer values. And, and we're going to see that here as I went ahead in part B and did some graphing. So check it out. It says, use your graphing calculator to display the graph of y equals x squared minus 3x minus 7. And it says, does this confirm? Well, ladies and gents, I, I did this on Desmos.com. I went ahead, I entered this function in, y equals x squared minus 3x minus 7. Obviously, this is the exact same thing. If I go ahead and put the y on this side and get rid of this over here, it's going to give me the exact same thing. And sure enough, you for sure see a parabola. This is the thing we've been working with for quite a while. And if I zoom in to look at these roots or these x-intercepts, do we see values that um, are, are not nice whole number integer values? Well, here's negative 1, here's negative 2, and the, and the intercept is in between. Here's 4, here's 5. That intercept is in between. So for sure, and Desmos has this beautiful click feature where I can identify those roots and, and you guys can see those are some like decimal values so negative 1.541 um, and 4.541 um, you know they, they decimals probably do some rounding there they're probably not, not nice three uh, digit uh, you know uh, decimals so um, yeah this happens. This happens in real life, and and we need to have an alternative ready for this. And and graphing sure is a beautiful technique for that. Um, we can estimate those using Desmos. Um, and like I said, the the estimate is um, for sure uh, a good idea there because, like I said, Desmos will do some rounding. We will have the ability to get an exact answer here eventually. But then finally, in question C, it says, "How in the heck could we use?" Uh, a table 
on our graphing calculator to help us figure out where those roots are. Well, uh, this is actually kind of interesting, but it requires a little bit of big brain activity here. So uh, let's go ahead and look at this. Remember, in a Desmos tab, I have the ability to tie any function to a table by clicking on that settings cog. And, oh, where'd my table go? I might have to have it like this here. Let me try this. Oops, seven. I actually might have to have the Y equals in front here. And now when I click that, for sure there's my table it'll say convert to a table here and this is what i want to do i click on that convert to table and remember an x-intercept is when y is equal to zero and y is equal to zero in between all negative and positive values of y now look at this because i have one right here i've got a value when x is negative two y is positive i've got a value when x is negative one the next door neighbor to negative two on the right hand side then my y is negative. Now that means somewhere in here, we cross over from, from positive to negative. So uh, sure enough, we confirm that that zero happens or that x-intercept or that root happens somewhere in there. The same thing is gonna happen over here if I keep my table going. Right, there we go, except I go the other direction. I go from negative to positive. So that means somewhere in there we have to cross over zero, so somewhere in between four and five. And do we have that confirmed here? Yeah, because that root is somewhere in between four and five at 4.541. Okay, so that's how we can use a graph and a table as really, really helpful things for this. All right, that's a, it's going to be a very, very useful tool. And especially with the onset of technologies like Desmos, um, GeoGebra might be one that you're using, a graphing calculator. Um, those things really make graphing a helpful aid. Okay, one more problem I want to take a look at is 8-80. So if you guys want to pause the video, find that one in your book. But we've got a quadratic in an alternative format, right? This is definitely a quadratic equation. We are going to have an x raised to a second power. And we're going to use some techniques that we've developed. We're going to put them together and make a sketch of the parabola without using a table first. Now, part A says go ahead and write the equation in standard form and use the zero product property to find the x-intercepts in the vertex and then sketch the parabola. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to pause the video. I'm going to do this. I'll explain my steps in a second. I'm going to encourage you to do the same thing. Go ahead, pause the video now, work this out, try to write this in standard form, and then unpause to check the work. All right, how'd you do? I started with the equation just like I was given it, and then I expanded that set of parentheses because I recognized it was squared. I went ahead and used some sort of foil technique or distributive property, however you call it. Some people like using a rectangle to do this, and I multiplied. X times X gives me X squared. X times one gives me one X. One times X gives me one X, and one times one gives me one. And that brought me to right here. Now, I've got kind of a messy equation there. So my last step is to go ahead and combine my like terms. And now when I have x squared, I'm sorry, y equals x squared plus 2x minus 15, I have this thing written in standard form. Okay, our next step is going to be to go ahead and take this equation, the one that I have at the bottom right here, and we're going to go ahead and we are going to factor this thing. So we've got the area as a sum. We want that area as a product. One more time for the sake of time. I'm going to pause the video and do this. I want you to pause the video as well. Try to factor this and see if you can come up with our area as a product. Two binomials that when multiplied give us x squared plus 2x minus 15. All right, I went ahead and paused the video. I did my work here. I factored this. I factored this using a generic rectangle. I wrote my x squared in the lower left-hand corner, my negative 15 in the upper right-hand corner, and then I knew I needed some product of the x's to equal negative 15 x squared. So the ones that I used were negative 3 x and 5 x. Conveniently, that multiplies to be negative 15 x squared, and it does give me the sum of 2 x that I was looking for. The last piece that I did here, I'll show you guys this, I went ahead and I took those binomials, or I took those factors, and I wrote them as the product of two binomials, and you guys can see that I put those right there. This is writing this thing in factor form, okay? Our last step is to go ahead and to use the zero product property to do 
some finding of the x-intercepts. Now, one more time, I'm going to remind you, you can set this thing equal to zero, and you can solve for each one of the factors, right? Because one of the factors has to be equal to zero if the thing equals zero. And we can find the x-intercepts because an x-intercept occurs when y equals zero. So I'm going to encourage you to pause the video one more time, one last time, and try to find your x-intercepts. All right, this is the last thing I asked you to do. I asked you to set that product equal to zero. I asked you to factor, um, I'm sorry, set each factor equal to zero and then solve to find your x-intercepts. So I went ahead and did that here. I've got two x-intercepts, uh, negative five, zero, and three, zero. And ladies and gents, the last thing that I did is I went ahead and I took the average of those x-intercepts uh, to find that midpoint, right? And I knew my vertex is then at negative one something. Okay, so this is kind of a, a process that we can use, but there, there has to be kind of an easier way. And I was given, look, look at all the work that we just did. I had you pause the video. I hope you tried these things. Um, the easier way might be to go ahead and find the x-intercepts in this particular case by um, doing some evaluation with the form that we already have. And that's what I'm going to try to do here uh, with this function. Uh, the way that it is written in this alternative format. So I'm going to go ahead and evaluate for when y is equal to zero. And, and we're going to see if this works out maybe slightly different algebraically and maybe even easier. Now check this out because I'm going to justify my work as I'm walking through this. I'm going to add 16 to both sides and zero and 16 makes this. Okay. And um, when I do that, I now have eliminated the 16 from the left. I'm sorry, from the right, added it to the left. And now I can take the square root of both sides. And doing that gives me, um, you know, the plus or minus 4 over here. And then I've got x plus 1. And I should probably show this step here, right? Because this might be the, you know, the step that troubles some, some you know, algebra students. Those two things cancel. And I get, uh, you know, plus or minus 4, right? I have the... Uh, you know, the positive and negative roots there. Um, and then I, I have to set this equal to, to both pieces, right? I have to consider the case where 4 is equal to x plus 1. I also have to consider where negative 4 is equal to x plus 1. And then I add 1, I'm sorry, subtract 1 from both sides, and I get x equals 3 right here, and I get x equals negative 5 right there. So was that process maybe a little bit easier? Because this points me to the 3, 0, and this points me to the negative 5, 0. Uh, was that easier? For sure. Maybe, right? And I can still do the exact same thing to find the vertex, right? 3 plus negative 5, that works out to be negative 2, and then cut that in half, and that tells me my vertex has got to be at negative 1 something. Okay? So now I've got those three points, and, and of course I can plug in negative 1 and figure out, and you know what, let me just do that real quick. If I plug in negative 1, we've got this minus that. Okay, so negative one and one make zero, and then voila, zero squared is zero, and zero minus 16 is negative 16, so my vertex has to be at negative one sixteen. So that could be an easier method, right? Now I've got those three points that really, really, really help me sketch that graph, okay? And this particular form that we have is, um, and I'm checking out part D here, this is sometimes called uh, graphing form, right? Because I can plot those two x-intercepts here at negative 5, 0, and 3, 0. I can go right in the middle down to, you know, 1, uh, negative 1, 16, negative 16, way down here. And now I could sketch that parabola, okay? And, uh, and that would be enough um, uh, for me to be able to do that. So it's called graphing form. You might also see this called vertex form because... If you know you can look at, if you can look at this right here and look at this right here and figure out the connection for where the vertex is hidden, you're doing pretty gosh darn well there. Okay, so vertex form or graphing form is the is the name of that format, and it has advantages. It has disadvantages. There is um, certainly. Uh, a time when we use standard form. There's certainly a time when we use vertex or graphing form. Okay. Um, depending on, on, on what the outcome is, right? What are, we, what are we trying to do with the information? Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, just a, a tiny bit of review preview here. And that review preview is right here at the bottom of my page. It is 83, 85, 86, and 87. And remember, we want you trying these things because um, making an effort and trying these things does help us uncover what kind of questions are laying 
in the weeds there, right? Helps us figure out what kind of questions need asking. So folks, thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day.